Amateur radio satellite operating is one of the fastest growing areas of the hobby worldwide and it sounds exciting, but how on earth do you get started? Joining us to give us the ins and the outs, or I guess the ups and the downs, is Sean Cutsko, KX9X, live from Illinois in the United States. So welcome to the RSGB convention, Sean. Oh, good afternoon, David. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really grateful to be here. We're really looking forward to your talk, and this is uh, your chance at home. If you've got any questions or comments to put to Sean during his presentation, please do it during so that we've got plenty of time to ask them afterwards. You just need to do that on the YouTube chat, and don't forget to include your name and your call sign if you have one within that. But now back to Sean. Let's find out about those satellites. Thanks again, David. And also, I wanted to give a, a thank you very much to Tammy for working behind the scenes to make all of the uh, technology function for the convention this afternoon. Well said. Um, very well said. Thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sean Kutzko, KX9X. I'm located in central Illinois in the United States, about two hours south of Chicago. Uh, I've been licensed since 1982, and um, I pursued a very conventional path in amateur radio. I got interested in uh, HF operating at first and uh, contesting and uh, long haul DXing, and uh, soon got introduced to VHF operating and uh, ended up working at ARRL for about 10 years and uh, helping develop some of their online programs, including National Parks on the Air, which uh, Ray Novak mentioned earlier this afternoon. Um, so in my pursuit of ham radio, uh, I accumulated a lot of gear and I uh, ended up having a very tall tower with lots of antennas on it. But then uh, my life circumstances changed and I ended up on the East Coast living in an apartment and I couldn't have a giant tower anymore. So I needed to find a new way to enjoy amateur radio. And uh, that involved a lot of portable operating and uh, operating outside of my um, uh, apartment. And uh, due to its portability, I ended up getting drawn into satellite operating and uh, immediately fell in love with it uh, for uh, its, its compact size, uh, its enjoyability, uh, and its portability. And so uh, I developed a real passion for satellite operating. And I'm going to introduce you to some of the, uh, the passion, I hope, uh, that I have for amateur radio satellites. And maybe this will be something that you will be interested in pursuing as well. So let's go to uh, my slide presentation and uh, hopefully we'll uh, have a, a very good uh, a chunk of information for you uh, here in the next 45 minutes or so. So a satellite, an overview of satellite operating, uh, there are about 25 satellites in orbit that you can make contacts through. Uh, most of the satellites today are what are known as CubeSats, meaning uh, they're very small, uh, 10 centimeter cubes uh, with an antenna and a transmitter receiver combination on board. Uh, most of these satellites are what are known as low Earth orbit. They're somewhere between 500 to 600 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, uh, and they pass overhead in your location roughly six times a day. And because they're low Earth orbit, they move across uh, the sky very quickly. So they're only above your local horizon for approximately 15 minutes at a time or so. Uh, so they move very quickly across your horizon. Uh, there are a couple of uh, terms that are very important to satellite operating. Uh, one is called AOS, which is known as acquisition of signal. That's when the satellite first appears over your local horizon. And then LOS is loss of signal. And that's at the end of a satellite pass where it drops down below your local horizon. Uh, so it's about 15 minutes plus or minus from acquisition of signal to loss of signal uh, at your location. Most of the satellites that are in orbit operate on the VHF and UHF bands. Uh, they use a, a combination of 144 megahertz and 440 megahertz. Uh, when the, uh, you transmit uh, on one of those bands and you receive on the other band. So when you transmit up to the satellite, that is known as the uplink. And the receive signal that you get back down from the satellite as no, is known as the downlink. So, for example, there's an FM satellite called AO91 that um, has an uplink on 440 megahertz and a downlink on 144 megahertz. 
Most of the satellites that are in orbit uh, transmit with uh, less than one watt of power. That doesn't sound like very much, but you have to remember that these are VHF and UHF signals. And even though uh, the satellite may be 500 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, you're still dealing with uh, line of sight communication. So uh, one watt transmitted from uh, a satellite with no obstructions on uh, VHF and UHF can still put out a rather potent signal, even with uh, a simple antenna that the satellite has on board. Uh, for the ground station, five watts and uh, a gain antenna, a handheld Yagi, which I will show you in just a little bit, is actually a remarkably powerful station for satellite work, and you can accomplish quite a bit uh, with such a small station. So why would you want to work satellites? I touched a little bit on this uh, during uh, my introduction. Um, satellites are accessible to all license classes. Uh, here in the United States, we have the entry-level technician class license, which allows VHF and UHF operation. Foundation licenses in the UK can, uh, can communicate on, on uh, these satellites, on these bands as well. Satellite communication is exceptionally reliable because it is not affected by terrestrial propagation fluctuations. So if there's a solar flare that takes out uh, propagation on the HF bands, you can still communicate through satellites because satellites are not affected by that. Satellite passes are exceptionally predictable. You can know weeks or uh, months in advance when a satellite pass is going to occur. And we'll get into how to track a satellite pass and know when a satellite pass is going to be overhead in just a little bit. It's extremely diverse. You can use voice communications, uh, you can use uh, CW, you can use digital modes if you like. I'm not much of a digital mode a satellite operator, so uh, I will defer to other satellite experts on how to communicate through some of the digital satellites. My presentation will be focusing primarily on uh, voice communications. Uh, satellites are ex uh, satellite operating is extremely compact and portable. You can use uh, only a, a handheld HT and a handheld uh, dual band antenna to communicate through some of these satellites. So it's extremely portable. Uh, you can take it with you on a holiday. You can take it with you on a business trip and still be able to squeeze in a little bit of ham radio enjoyment uh, using such a small compact station. And it's exceptionally satisfying. Um, I came from the world of HF contesting and DXing, and uh, the, there is a, a very strong enjoyment factor using uh, uh, satellite communications. Uh, satellite passes are, are rather quick, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, you can get uh, a pileup experience uh, on, a, on a short satellite pass. So it's like a little short mini pileup uh, experience on some, of the, on some of the satellite passes. There are plenty of awards that you can collect for uh, various operating achievements. And um, if you operate portable, you can go to some rare locations, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. And the satellite community is uh, an extremely close-knit group of people. I've made friends all around the world, just like you make in uh, other aspects of amateur radio. Satellite community is a great place to build lifelong friendships. So what can you, uh, what can you actually work using uh, ham radio satellites? So each satellite has what is known as a footprint. And a footprint is simply an area of coverage uh, that the satellite has as it's passing overhead. Um, the area of coverage of a footprint will vary from satellite to satellite because each satellite is, uh, has a different height uh, that it is orbiting the Earth with. Uh, on average, FM satellites uh, will uh, have a footprint of in the neighborhood of around 5,000 kilometers. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the linear satellites that use sideband and CW uh, have a coverage area of around 8,000 kilometers. So there's quite a bit of difference there. As the satellite is moving overhead, the area of coverage in the footprint will constantly change. So uh, stations that you hear at the beginning of a pass uh, may drift out of the footprint by the time the pass is over for you. So you have a moving target and the area of coverage of the satellite is constantly shifting. Um, real DX is very, very possible on uh, some of the satellites, especially for... Um, for stations over in uh, the UK, you have access to most of Western and Eastern Europe using uh, the FM satellites. Uh, Africa and Asia is possible if there are operators available in those countries. Um, communications with the United States, uh, certainly the Eastern part of the United States are, are, are relatively common on uh, even FM satellites. And uh, the DXCC award working a hundred different countries on satellite 
is uh, is mathematically possible. Um, sometimes you get into issues where uh, you can uh, have coverage to a country uh, in, uh, in, a, in a satellite's footprint, but there may not be any operators there uh, in that particular country. So if anybody's interested in going on a de-expedition to some far-flung corner of the Earth, uh, see about taking some satellite gear with you as well. You might make a lot of people very happy in the satellite community by doing that. Uh, the primary unit of geography that is exchanged during satellite passes is the Maidenhead grid square, what um, uh, was re just referred to in the club log presentation as locator squares. Um, those are roughly two degrees of longitude wide by one degree of latitude high. Uh, and there are about 34,000 grid squares all around the uh, world. And one of the primary awards that uh, you can achieve is the ARRL's VHF UHF Century Club Award, which is known as VUCC for uh, confirming contact with 100 different uh, Maidenhead grid squares uh, anywhere in uh, the world. So that's a, a relatively easy award that you can pursue on the satellites. So I mentioned earlier that there's a, a, a difference between footprints between uh, FM and the linear satellites. Here's a map that's focused on uh, London in the UK. The, uh, the uh, inner circle that's closest to the United Kingdom is 5,500 kilometers in every direction from the United Kingdom. And the outer band uh, shows 8,000 kilometers from uh, the United Kingdom. So you can see that by uh, operating linear satellites uh, as opposed to the FM satellites, you uh, get a considerable amount of more geography that you can reach uh, via satellite. Uh, if you look at the path from the UK to the United States, you can see that uh, the difference between 5,500 kilometers and 8,000 kilometers opens up the vast majority of the United States to you, including much of the Western states as well. So there is a definite... Uh, if you're interested in long haul communications and DX work, there is a definite advantage to getting on the linear satellites, which use sideband and CW. I'll go into more detail between the two uh, in just a moment. So the two basic types of satellites that I'll be discussing today are FM versus linear. Again, you can use digital modes through some satellites. That is not my area of expertise, so I will defer to another uh, satellite presenter who has more experience using the digital modes on the satellite for uh, that information. FM satellites are single channel satellites. That means that only one person can communicate through the satellite at a time. Uh, it functions very much like an orbiting repeater. You can think of it in those terms. Uh, the capture effect for FM signals is very much in effect using a single channel satellite. The loudest signal that the satellite hears is what is retransmitted on the satellite's downlink. There are several examples of FM satellites, PO101, AO91 and AO92, and uh, Saudi Sat SO50, launched by uh, the Saudi Arabians uh, um, several years ago, uh, is still a, a very active and functional satellite. Linear satellites, uh, instead of FM, they use sideband and CW. They have on board what is known as a transponder. And a transponder actually provides anywhere between 20 to 60 kilohertz of real bandwidth that you can tune across just as if you were tuning across uh, an HF band, like 20 meters. You can hear multiple contacts going on simultaneously using sideband. Again, it sounds just like an HF band. Uh, RS-44 is a good example of uh, a linear satellite that has uh, great distance capabilities. You can communicate uh, well uh, around 8,000 kilometers using RS-44. Uh, a couple of uh, Chinese satellites are the CAS series, 4A and 4B. Also launched by the Chinese are the XW series. Uh, there are two or three of those that are active at this point. And then uh, the venerable uh, Oscar 7 that was launched back in 1974 uh, went silent for many years and then suddenly sprang back to life in the 1980s and has been going strong ever since. Uh, it is uh, very fragile uh, and uh, can be a little temperamental at times, but uh, under the right circumstances, you can still communicate uh, and make contacts through Oscar 7. You just have to be a little gentle with it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite an old bird at this point in time. Uh, something else that I'd like to mention, uh, since uh, this is uh, being focused on the UK, 
is uh, the Q0100 geostationary satellite. We here in the United States don't have access to this particular satellite, uh, but uh, having access to a satellite using uh, some of the microwave frequencies that is above your horizon for hours at a time is very, very desirable. Um, I would encourage you to watch the video that I have posted here on my presentation by Dominic, M0BLF, which uh, he provides a wonderful introductory video on accessing the QO100 satellite equipment he uses to get started and uh, some basic concepts of how uh, to communicate through that particular satellite. We here in the, uh, in the United States and in North America, we wish we had access to a satellite like QO100. Uh, hopefully one day we will, we will get a satellite that has uh, that kind of capability. But for now, we have to use the uh, low earth orbit uh, FM and linear satellites. So what kind of kit do you need to even get started on the satellites? Um, well, you need to have radios that will transmit and receive on both two meters and 70 centimeters. Uh, this could be a dedicated radio for satellite, or you could use two separate radios. I know plenty of new satellite operators that get started on the FM satellites using two separate uh, handy talkies, and that, those work perfectly fine. You will need an antenna that can cover two meters and 70 centimeters. Uh, my friend Michael, HB9WDF, is showing off uh, what is known as an aero antenna, which is three elements on two meters and seven elements on 70 centimeters. It's very lightweight, it's very compact, and you hold it in your hand. And they work exceptionally well for uh, communicating via satellite. They provide around 8 dB of gain on those bands, which is uh, quite remarkable for those uh, for such a small antenna. You'll need a device known as a diplexer. What a diplexer basically does is it splits the, uh, the RF between uh, your transmitted signal and your receive signal, and it isolates your transmitted signal from your receive radio. If you don't do that, um, your receive radio, because it is in such close proximity to your antenna and close proximity to your transmit radio, you can experience uh, an overload of your receiver's front end, which is known as descents, and you want to avoid that. So by, uh, by putting a diplexer in line uh, with one of the uh, bands on your, uh, on your antenna, you can uh, help eliminate uh, desensitization of your receiver. You also need to know when the satellite is going to be overhead. So there are uh, several satellite tracking apps uh, for your smartphone. If you don't uh, have a smartphone, you can use uh, various pieces of satellite tracking software. Uh, we'll get into uh, some examples of both of those in just a moment. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, some of these components, if, uh, if you've never tried satellite operating before, you may have some of uh, the components that you need in order to get on the air. Uh, if you have uh, access to uh, some of the uh, all band radios, such as the ICOM 7000 or the Yaesu 818, uh, and a two meter vertical or a Yagi at your home station, you may already have uh, uh, enough gear to get started on, uh, on, on the satellites. So uh, don't think that uh, you have to have a, a wonderfully dedicated station in order to get started on amateur radio satellite operating. I'll show you an example of how I got started from my home station in just a little bit. So to get started, uh, you can uh, get started with a beginner station using just an HT and that handheld Yagi that I described earlier. Um, in this particular photo that you see on your screen, this is when I was in London in uh, June of 2018. I was actually transmitting from the top of a car park in central London and uh, worked stations from Italy to all the way down to uh, the Azores Islands, uh, just using uh, a simple dual band HT and that handheld antenna. Uh, yeah, it was very easy to transport in my uh, carry-on luggage and didn't have any problems with, uh, with getting it through customs or anything like that. So the advantages of a station like this are it is extremely portable, but a major disadvantage is that uh, this particular setup that I'm using is uh, transmitting in what is known as half duplex, which means uh, when I transmit, I cannot hear my uh, signal going through the satellite in real time. Uh, knowing when I am making it into the satellite uh, is a critical component for success, especially when you're getting started. So you can use a dual band HT like I am using in this setup, and you can certainly make contacts with it. But 
if you don't have a receiver where you can simultaneously hear your own signal going through the satellite, you're at a bit of a disadvantage, which when you're first getting started can lead to some frustration if you are calling on the satellite and you can't tell if you're actually making it into the satellite. Uh, so I would encourage you if you're first getting started uh, to use two radios uh, to so you can hear your own signal through the satellite downlink in real time. It will make a big uh, it, it will make a, a big difference in your success rate. And as we all know, when you're first starting something new, uh, early success will lead to more interest and more curiosity and continuing. Another example, this is what I use uh, when I go operating portable, is uh, I have a camera, uh, a camera, a photo camera bag that I have equipped with two Yesu 817s and uh, a battery pack. That's a, a lithium polymer battery that uh, uh, is a 12 amp hour battery. And uh, I wear that camera bag over the front of, of my uh, torso, and I can uh, use this as a full duplex all mode five watt portable satellite station. And as I mentioned earlier, five watts is a considerable amount of power on the satellites. So this is an extremely portable setup that I can take when I want to transmit from other grid squares besides the one that I live in. Uh, I have had exceptionally good success with this portable setup uh, and uh, have transmitted from over 80 different grid squares here in the United States, as well as a couple of different uh, DXCC entities in the Caribbean. Uh, it is a, it is an extremely potent portable station. Don't let the small size fool you. Uh, bear with me here for just a moment. I need to uh, cough, so I'm going to mute my microphone. My apologies. So as I mentioned earlier, um, you may already have equipment lying around your home station to get started on the FM satellites. And this is a prime example of uh, how to do that. So uh, when, uh, when COVID first hit in 2020, we all got uh, locked down and I had a lot of spare time at home. And uh, I was already uh, very keen on satellite operating to begin with, but I decided I'd try to see if I could get uh, a station set up at home using gear that I already had. And uh, I was very successful using what I already had. So for two meters, I was using my main HF radio at the time, which was an ICOM 746 Pro. I used that for two meter receive. And on 70 centimeters, I broke out the radio that I use for my mobile operations, which is an ICOM 706 Mark II G. My antennas were uh, very simple. Uh, I, I rent the, uh, uh, the apartment that I live in, so I don't have the ability to put up a giant tower, uh, but my landlord was gracious enough to let me put up a mast with some VHF and UHF antennas. So I have a five element beam on two meters that is horizontally polarized. And I have um, a, a, a 70 centimeter uh, horizontal uh, or omnidirectional antenna that's known as an egg beater. Uh, on a little tripod on the roof. Both are only about seven or eight meters off the ground. Um, neither of my antennas has a preamp. I do not have any kind of software interface on uh, this, this configuration to control uh, Doppler correction, which I'll get into Doppler correction in just a little bit. Um, I don't have a way to uh, computer control my antenna rotator. All of this is completely 100% manually operated. And this is what I had uh, lying around during uh, 2020 when COVID hit. Um, this station has several flaws to it. Um, one of the big flaws is that my receive antenna or my 70 centimeter antenna in this setup is not very good on receive. Um, I don't have a preamp attached to it and it's not much of a gain antenna. So I don't hear very well on this uh, antenna on 70 centimeters. So that limits me to using uh, only antennas that uh, have a two meter downlink. Uh, I also have issues with uh, receiving on two meters because my antenna is in a fixed horizontal plane. Um, as the satellites are passing overhead, they don't pass overhead in a stationary position. They're constantly rolling and tumbling as, uh, as they're moving across your horizon. The antennas for these satellites are basically quarter wave vertical whips. And as the antenna or as the satellite is rolling and tumbling overhead, the orientation of that vertical antenna is constantly shifting. So that means that the plane of that antenna is 
constantly changing as well. If my antenna is not perfectly lined up in a horizontal plane with the satellite's antenna, I'm going to hear what is known as polarization fading on my signal. Polarization fading is a difference between my, sat my antenna's horizontal polarization and the antenna's polarization on the satellite. Uh, if there, uh, there can be as much as a 20 dB difference in signal between uh, uh, polarized antennas, uh, horizontal polarization versus vertical polarization. So uh, I have deep receive nulls and fades that occur on these satellites from time to time during a pass. Despite all of these negative uh, attributes to my station here at home, I'm still uh, quite successful with my satellite operations. Uh, in nine months in 2020, I made contact with almost uh, over 150 different uh, grid squares here in North America and Central America using this setup with both FM and sideband uh, satellites. So if you don't have uh, the latest and greatest satellite capable radio, and if you don't have the latest and greatest uh, uh, circularly polarized antennas for satellite operation, do not let that deter you from experimenting from home. Amateur radio is a hobby of experimentation. Try to cobble together a station and see what you can put together with gear you already have. You may be very surprised. I was certainly surprised at my level of success using the station that I have here with all of its limitations. I was still very, uh, I was still able to enjoy plenty of satellite operating time. So how do you track a satellite? Again, I mentioned that um, you have to know where the satellite is in order to communicate through it. Uh, there are a couple of pieces of software that are great if you're operating from home. Uh, the gold standard for Windows-based systems is a piece of software called SatPC32. It's uh, about $50 US, uh, and uh, uh, that gets you all kinds of tracking information as well as computer control interfaces uh, and uh, Doppler correction as well. If you're, uh, if you're in the uh, iOS family, Mac Doppler is extremely popular uh, for, the, for the Macintosh community. If you prefer to use a smartphone app, uh, iPhone has uh, several apps available for it. I prefer an app called GoSat Watch, uh, which you have an image there on the right side of your screen. Uh, it is not free. It costs, uh, it costs a few pounds, but it is, uh, in my opinion, an extremely versatile and uh, solid app to use for tracking satellites. If you'd rather uh, experiment with something that doesn't cost any money, uh, you can uh, download an app called SatSat on your iPhone. Uh, if you're using an Android device, AmSat Droid is available available for you. And uh, the website Heavens Above also has a satellite tracking uh, app that you can use uh, for an Android device. If you'd prefer to just go to a website, uh, the AMSAT, which is the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation uh, located here in uh, North America, has a website where you can punch in your, uh, your grid square, your latitude and longitude, and uh, it will print out uh, a, a predictions, a list of satellite passes uh, for your location for a specific satellite. There's also an independent website, uh, n2yo.com, where you can punch in the name of the satellite and it will track it in real time as well as display the satellite's footprint in real time. Uh, to know uh, what satellites are currently operational, you can go to the AMSAT current status page at the URL that I have listed there on, uh, on my slide. And all of these URLs will be uh, made available uh, on the YouTube presentation after the fact as well. So there are several important things to remember about satellite operating. I mentioned uh, a, a communications process known as full duplex. That is the ability to hear yourself on the satellite's downlink in real time as you are transmitting. This is exceptionally helpful for you on the FM satellites, but if you move over to the linear satellites with sideband and CW, it is absolutely critical that you have that because you have to navigate 20 to 60 kilohertz of bandwidth in order to find your, uh, your transmitted signal on the satellite's downlink. If you don't have full duplex capability trying to use a linear satellite, you are in for a very, very difficult process. It can be done, but uh, that is best left to extremely experienced satellite operators to try uh, uh, using a linear satellite without full duplex capability. 
I mentioned earlier, there is uh, something on the satellites called the Doppler effect. So we've all seen the videos where you're, you're in a standing next to a, a train track and the train goes by and uh, the train whistle blows. And as the train goes past, the pitch of the train whistle decreases. That is a, a, a phenomenon that also occurs on satellites as they are passing overhead. Uh, the Doppler effect is... Um, increased as you go up in frequency in the radio spectrum. So as a satellite is going overhead during a satellite pass, you will have to adjust your 70 centimeter frequency throughout the pass. Depending on the satellite you are using, that may be your transmit frequency or your receive frequency. It will depend entirely upon which satellite you are using. The FM satellites often have a CTCSS tone attached to them. Most of them function at 67 hertz. There are a couple of exceptions to that. Uh, if you are getting started on the FM satellites, you will need to make sure that you have your CTCSS tone enabled on your transmit signal uh, for the FM satellites. Clear horizons are best. If you can find a location with uh, nothing blocking your local horizon that will maximize your uh, transmit and receive success. Uh, leafy trees can definitely impact your receive signal on satellites, especially on 70 centimeters. Obviously, buildings and other objects are going to impact your performance on the satellite as well. The ideal location is someplace that is up high and away from any objects that are blocking your local horizon. Uh, if you live out in the countryside, uh, find yourself a park or a clearing somewhere, uh, or if you're operating from home, get your antennas up on a tower to maximize your visibility of the horizon. If you live in a more urban area, do what I did when I was visiting London and uh, set up on a car park or uh, the rooftop of a building you may have access to, something like that. Maximize your uh, visibility to your local horizon and that will improve your chances of success. The cardinal rule of satellite operating is if you cannot hear any signals coming through on the satellite, please, please, please do not transmit. You may actually be able to transmit into the satellite and for various reasons, you simply can't hear it yet. Um, there are numerous cases of new satellite operators and experienced satellite operators for that matter uh, that are unintentionally causing interference with other users of the satellite who can hear the satellite properly. So if you cannot hear other stations on a satellite pass, you're not going to hear yourself either. So please wait until you hear other signals on the satellite before you start transmitting. Otherwise you may unintentionally be causing interference to other users of the pass. One of the nice things about having uh, uh, an aspect of the hobby that's extremely portable is you can go out and transmit from other locations. Um, this is known as roving in the satellite community, uh, being able to transmit from multiple grid squares over time. You can take your gear on a holiday, a business trip. You can even have a dedicated roving adventure to a very rare grid square. Some of these grid squares, at least here in the United States, uh, don't have very many uh, ham radio operators in them, let alone ham radio operators that are interested in satellite operations. And as I mentioned earlier, there are numerous operating awards that focus on maidenhead grid squares. So hams naturally like to collect things like DXCC countries, for example. Uh, and so, uh, Establishing uh, and confirming radio contact with as many grid squares as possible over satellites is one aspect of satellite operating that many uh, satellite operators enjoy. They want to contact with as many grid squares as they can possibly get. So um, some of these uh, some of these rare grid squares, uh, uh, dedicated satellite operators actually take their gear and go set up in these squares for uh, a period of time. Um, and there is always a great demand for these squares. And if you're interested in, uh, in portable operating or you like, uh, you like running pileups on HF or in a contest, uh, satellite operating can produce very similar pileups from very rare grid squares. So it's worth considering. It can also be done very inexpensively and you can combine your satellite operating with other portable activities such as summits on the air or as uh, Ray and 9 ja mentioned earlier, the parks on the air. Uh, parks on the air and summits on the air both allow satellite communications to, to count for their awards programs. So if you're already interested in POTA and SOTA, uh, you can bring satellite gear along with you 
that uh, doesn't take up much space, doesn't add much additional weight to your current kit, and uh, gives you another uh, venue to, uh, to get uh, contacts for your Parks on the Air and Summits on the Air activity. You might uh, draw some very interested spectators. Uh, this was me down in Florida in a, in a rare grid square uh, EL86 near the uh, Tampa St. Pete uh, area, which is 99% uh, water. So I set up uh, right on the beach and uh, these kids uh, definitely had questions about what I was doing uh, on the satellites at the time. That's uh, one of my favorite photos of, uh, of my operating activities. So I'd like to uh, demonstrate what it's like when you go on one of these uh, satellite uh, roves that I was talking about. Here's a short clip of a video I made uh, when I did a, a giant rover operation in uh, July of 2020. Um, I set out from uh, my home and transmitted from 12 different grid squares in uh, the central Midwest uh, United States. Uh, for five days back in July of 2020. And uh, this, uh, per this video clip I'm going to show you is about a minute's worth of me operating uh, an FM satellite uh, from uh, just uh, on the east side of the Mississippi River uh, in the state of Illinois on my way uh, to Iowa and Missouri to cover some of the other rare grid squares I was going to transmit from on this trip. So uh, this is uh, not one of the rarest squares I activated, but uh, it was still very high in demand. And uh, I made about 25 contacts during a 15 minute pass on an FM satellite, which is pretty darn good. So uh, I'd like to uh, ask the folks uh, in master control to uh, go ahead and uh, show this video for us and we'll see what it's like to operate a pileup on an FM satellite. All right, so you can uh, you can see that uh, things can get uh, quite uh, quite frenetic and heated during an FM satellite pass, and uh, for me and uh, other people who are interested in contesting and DXing who like to run a pileup, uh, you can definitely have that same experience. Uh, on an FM satellite pass when you're transmitting from a rare grid square like that. You might have noticed in the video that I was uh, constantly rotating my antenna during that satellite pass, and that was me adjusting for uh, the maximum receive signal, trying to bring my receive antenna in alignment with the satellite's uh, antenna as it's orbiting overhead. So that was me manually correcting for uh, the polarization fading effect that I described earlier in this presentation. So holding your antenna in your hand actually gives you a faster way to respond to those types of um, uh, polarization fades as opposed to having your antenna mounted on a tripod. If you can hold your antenna in your hand like that, uh, you'll be able to respond to those fades much quicker. So your first steps in satellites, this all sounds very interesting to you. You're saying to yourself, how do I get started? The easiest thing you can do is simply monitor satellites from home with your existing two meter uh, antenna. Um, I have a few satellites listed here on the screen with uh, uh, some of their uh, downlink frequencies on two meters. Uh, if you have a 70 centimeter at home, you can try listening to uh, 70 centimeter satellites downlinks as well. Uh, I have provided uh, a link to the AMSAT FM frequency list and the linear frequency satellite list uh, here on this slide. And again, uh, links to these uh, resources on, on the web will be available uh, after, uh, after my presentation. You'll be able to, to see these, uh, these links on the, on the, when, the, when the presentation is posted to YouTube. 
So uh, there's certainly nothing wrong with uh, just trying to monitor an FM pass as it's going over your head. Download one of the apps or go to uh, one of the websites that I mentioned earlier in this pass, find out when one of these satellites are gonna be overhead and see what you can hear. You might be very pleasantly surprised. Lots of resources are available for uh, more information on satellites. Of course, you should head directly over to AMSAT UK's website at amsatuk.org. There is tons of beginner information there. Uh, definitely a solid resource if you're uh, curious about learning more uh, on satellite operating. I have several blogs that I've published for DX Engineering, and you can find those on onallbands.com. I encourage you to uh, read those. Uh, there are many satellite operators that have a Twitter account, and uh, they are constantly posting information on Twitter about their activities, if they're going to be transmitting from a rear grid locator, uh, lots of technical information, lots of people uh, chiming in and offering advice for newcomers. So if you have a Twitter account, I would strongly suggest uh, checking out the AMSAT UK's Twitter feed or uh, look for the hashtag AMSAT. Uh, you, will, you will find a wealth of information on Twitter uh, from the satellite uh, community uh, who, are who are present on that social media platform. There's an operator here in the United States, Paul Over in KE0PBR who has developed a wonderful cheat sheet for uh, uh, explaining the relationship between a satellite's uplink frequency and a satellite's downlink frequency and how that relationship changes during a satellite pass. Uh, so if you're, if you're new to satellite operating, especially the linear satellites, I strongly suggest you download Paul's cheat sheet. It will help you learn how to find yourself on uh, the satellite downlink frequency, uh, and that will increase your rate of success. It's a wonderful resource. Paul put a lot of time into creating it, and it makes uh, uh, transitioning from FM satellites to linear satellites much easier. It's a great resource. Uh, also, I have uh, a lot of video uh, uh, satellite tutorials that I created for DX Engineering that are available on the YouTube channel. DX Engineering has lumped all of my videos together in a playlist, and uh, that link that I've got on the screen now will provide uh, you with all of the uh, uh, satellite videos I've done for DX Engineering in link, uh, in, in, uh, in a playlist. So be sure to check all of that out and um, uh, be sure to uh, contact me and ask any questions that you may have uh, regarding that information. So that's all I have for you today. If you have any questions, by all means, reach out to me. You can email me, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, you can connect with me on Facebook. I'd be happy to have you as, uh, as a friend on Facebook. Uh, and I would be uh, happy to uh, entertain any questions that you may have on satellite operating while we have a little bit of time left. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Really good. Makes me feel like I want to go out there now. If I had one of those arrow antenna, I think I would. <laughs> anyway, we're just uh, going to go. But before I ask some of the questions that people have asked, I must give a shout out to the first couple of messages we had. Great coverage on how to communicate through satellites. That was from Graham VK6MIL. And uh, from Lars SM0TGU from Sweden, from AMSAT Sweden, actually. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, Lars. So uh, Matthew Strickland says, would I be able to receive and listen to FM passes with a dual band HT and its supplied antenna before I invest in an arrow or homebrew or something myself? Uh, so if you're talking about receiving satellites using uh, your standard rubber duck antenna, um, you may be able to hear some passes if you are uh, out in a clearing uh, with a good uh, view of overhead or the horizon. Um, I would strongly su suggest that if you're gonna try using uh, such a modest antenna that you open up your squelch uh, wide open so you can hear any type of weaker signal that may be coming through. Um, at the very least, I would I, I would say your, your rate of success is not going to be very high uh, if that's all you have, I would certainly encourage you to try. Um, but uh, even if you could get one of the uh, uh, one of the extendable whips, one of those 19 inch ex extendable whips, 
uh, you you would have better rates of success than with a standard uh, um, small rubber duck type antenna. Also, if you're going to be experimenting with that type of antenna for receive, make sure that you're constantly moving uh, the uh, orientation of your HT around to change the polarization of your uh, of your rubber duck antenna. Uh, you may not hear the satellite because of what I described earlier with the alignment of your receive antenna and the satellite's transmit antenna. So if you're going to be using an HT with a rubber duck to try to receive, constantly move your uh, antenna around until you hear a signal. Thanks very much, Sean. I've got a, a two-part question now from uh, Edmund Spicer. Don't have your call sign, sorry. Uh, hello, Sean, and thank you for the great presentation. I'm still to have my first satellite QSO, shamefully, despite having an ELK antenna, a diplexer, and lots of handhelds. Um, of the FM EasySats that are currently operational, is there one in particular that is especially easy to access for somebody like me? Mm, very good question. Um, of the current FM satellites that are in orbit right now, uh, I would say I would try your luck with, um, this is this is a qualified answer to your question. I would say uh, try your hand at either AO91 or AO92. Now, I say that this is a qualified answer because these satellites are, uh, are uh, their batteries are starting to run low. And they've been up in orbit for a little while now, uh, and uh, they're starting to run a little bit low on juice. So uh, they're only going to be active when uh, they are in what is known as uh, uh, outside of eclipse. So the best time to listen for those satellites is during your local daylight hours. Um, don't try to listen to them um, during the evening hours when the when the when it's dark outside. Um, they're trying to uh, conserve batteries on those two particular satellites. Uh, and so um, they're discouraging operation on those uh, FM satellites uh, during nighttime hours. Uh, having said that, uh, both of those satellites, when they're up and running during the day, have a wonderfully loud signal on two meters uh, uh, for a two meter downlink. So I would steer you in that direction during daylight hours. Just as a, a slight aside for me now, a question, as I'm curious, mm -hmm. those satellites then, the battery problems, presumably it's just the batteries have got old and are aging. Is there a way of replacing them or changing them? Mm, the I don't I don't claim to be a, an expert on the mechanics of the of the battery operations on satellites, but uh, the basic answer is is no. Uh, you know the 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 environment that they are in is extremely harsh. Solar radiation uh, batters satellites on a regular basis, and so um, the batteries are going to take some abuse over time. And uh, they are doing what they can to uh, make them as available as possible. Uh, but uh, over the course of time, the, the, the life of the batteries are going to deteriorate. So um, there are new satellites that are being uh, scheduled for launch on a regular basis. And FM satellites are uh, some of the easier satellites to launch. So over the course of time, you will find newer satellites that uh, will replace some of the ones that are uh, uh, aging out. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Peter Goodall comes back as well to try and help Edmund. He mentions, like you, the AO91 and 92. You have to be careful when you use them. He also mentions SO50, which he yes. said, I won't call easy, but if you run duplex, you should be able to work the work them fine with the elk. Yes, that's true. Um, so the SO, the reason why I suggested AO91 and AO92 is because they have a downlink on two meters. SO50 has a downlink on 70 centimeters and it transmits with slightly less power than uh, some of the other FM satellites. So it's a bit trickier to receive. However, it has proven uh, a solid uh, performer. Uh, it's been up in the, it's been in orbit for uh, like 20 years. So um, if you have 70 centimeter receive capability and a good shot at the horizon, it's worth listening to SO50 as well. Excellent. Thank you. Paul Graham says tracking software, Windows and Mac were mentioned, but there's also gpredict for Linux, which will also run on Windows. That is true. That is uh, an omission on my part. Thank you for bringing that uh, to everybody's attention. We, mu yeah, we must look after our Linux. Uh, it uses. Um, now this from Paul G0VKT, any software that shows multiple satellites on a real-time map that I could use to monitor and check for passes? Yes, the GoSat Watch app for iOS uh, allows you to show uh, locations of multiple satellites in real-time. Uh, the uh, um, 
Uh, the SAT PC32 software for Windows allows that. I am not, I have not used the Mac Doppler software, but I would be very surprised if that did not offer that capability. Thanks. Uh, Dave Delahaye says, is the technique of contacting low orbit satellites the same as you'd use to contact the ISS? And am I right in thinking there's a repeater on the ISS? There is a repeater on the ISS. There's also a digipeater on the ISS and you need to, uh, uh, they, they don't have them both functioning at the same time. There is um, a feed on Twitter that will give you up-to-date information on the status of the ISS uh, whether it's a satellite, a, a, vo a voice repeater, or uh, the digipeter, which one of those is active. You can also uh, follow the status of the uh, ISS on the AMSAT status page, the link uh, that I provided in the, my presentation earlier. You'll get, a, you'll get a feedback on which of the, uh, which of the uh, repeater capability is functioning on the ISS. Communicating a satellite uh, pass, trying to work a satellite pass that's lower in the horizon as opposed to higher in the horizon. There is um, a definite challenge to working satellites lower in the horizon than, uh, than directly overhead. Um, the, but the bottom line is if you have a clear shot to the horizon, uh, you should be able to hear the satellites uh, as soon as they pop up over the horizon. I live here in uh, the Midwest of the United States, which is uh, extremely flat and uh, is very uh, agrarian. So there aren't a lot of trees in my particular area. If I drive 10 minutes outside of town to um, one of the local farmer's fields, uh, I have a wonderful view of the horizon er in every direction. And uh, I can hear satellites almost immediately when they pop up over the horizon. The advantage of working a, a, a satellite pass out um, uh, close to the horizon is that is going to uh, have the longest reach of your satellite's footprint. So if you're interested in working DX, the closer to the edge of uh, the closer to the horizon you communicate through the satellite, the farther reach across the opposite side of that footprint, you're going to be able to communicate. So if you want to work DX, you need to get very skilled at working satellite passes that are near the edge of the horizon. Right. Very full answer. Thank you for that. Uh, Peter Goodall actually adds as well that the ISS detector program on I, uh, the app on iOS and Android gives multi-sat overview on mobile devices too. I'd like to give a shout out to Peter. Peter's one of the great satellite operators in uh, uh, on on that side of the ocean, and uh, I've 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 worked Peter several times on satellite. It's good to have you on board, Peter. Thank you, um, Andrew Wright says. Um, you can hear a satellite quite well with a base station vertical, but not as good as a Yagi, but better than an HT Ducky, one of those sort of cheap little mm -hmm. um, aerials that you get basically standard, don't you? Mm -hmm. um, also, Ram VU2GRM says the good old Orbitron must still be good to track. Oh, goodness. Uh, that's, a, that's another omission on my part. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Orbitron is... Uh, uh, still doing its thing. Uh, if you have access to Orbitron, it, it certainly will function well. And I must say, as, as a non-satellite user, at least so far, I love the name Orbitron. It does sound a bit cooler than some of these other VU mm -hmm. 50s and things like that. But mm -hmm. anyway, thank you very much to everybody at home for answering those questions. And most of all, of course, thank you very much to you, Sean, for a wonderful presentation. I'm sure that you're going to get a lot more people looking at satellite now, especially as you can start, as you said, just by listening which is a great sure. one and a directional antenna. So we want to thank you very much indeed for your presentation today and for joining us on the RSGB online convention. Thanks very much, oh, Sean. It was, a, it was a tremendous honor. Thank you for having me. And if I can help any of you get started in satellites, by all means, reach out to me. I would be happy to help. We will. And uh, as you said, we'll be putting up your contact details and slides and things when we get the uh, tidied up versions of these talks put up on YouTube in the next few weeks. Great. Thank you very much, Sean. Have a great right. day. Thank you. 73.